everyone and welcome to another video about all things menopause. I'm Diane Danzybrink, menopause counsellor and founder of menopausesupport.co.uk and the hashtag Make Menopause Matter campaign. And I am delighted today to be speaking to a lady that I have been friends with on Twitter for quite a long time, but we have never actually spoken until a few minutes ago. Um, this is the lovely Dr. Mandy Leonhart, and Mandy is a GP. She's also a menopause specialist, and she's lots more than that, but she's gonna tell you all about that herself. So Mandy, a very warm welcome. Thank you for your time. And would you be kind enough to introduce yourself to everybody? Well, thank you. Thank you for having me, Diane. And um, and thanks also for, for setting up your campaign, which is amazing and <laughs> has got many signatures. And I'm more than happy to support that. It's so important. And um, well, yes, I'm a GP um, and um, I have um, in my journey as a doctor, I have found that um, I have come across uh, men menopause and, and women who suffer from symptoms. And I found that I didn't know enough myself. So I went on to train and um, because I'm a woman, I'm affected by it personally um, so I wanted to find the best solutions and I personally didn't find that my own doctors weren't super helpful so I thought if a woman cannot you know if a, if a, if a, if a doctor can't get the appropriate help from her own doctors how do non-medically trained women get help when they yeah. go and see a doctor so I am um, I've, I've got very passionate about this and developed an interest but also beyond HRT I find all hormones uh, very very fascinating estrogen is, is our fuel our our power the powerhouse we we all need but um it's it's more than that and i sort of um i look beyond uh, just um estrogen um because some women um can't have it or other women don't do very well on any any amount of estrogen sadly yeah. when we give it to so the reason that I specifically asked Mandy to chat to me today is she mentioned all those other hormones. Um, and Mandy, am I right that you am I right that you're a nutritionist too? Yes. So I, yeah. I did. Um, I'm what they call. So the it's MNU. So it's an evidence based um, course that I did uh, looking at uh, at nutrition. Um, I don't. Um, I, I do use nutrition. I advise women about nutrition, but what I don't do is meal plans or I don't, I'm not a dietitian, so I yeah. wouldn't be advising a, someone who's severely diabetic about what to eat, but I can, I have an interest in nutrition and I have had that, um, that, that training and I am a, a nutri I can call myself um, a, a nutritionist. Yes. But you can consider that too, when you're working with women individually. Com yes, it's completely important. And um, it is uh, another complex field. I don't know if you know Tim Spector, you know, yes. there is no or diet um, and this is so important and again we can't just say to them go low carb and feel great go keto feel great go paleo feel great it does not work like that yeah. and that's why we have to give individual advice to each woman and, and look at how do you re do they respond to food and 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 and, and eat you know still eat the rainbow eat healthy foods so, you know there are some categories where we can really say categorically this is bad for you and this is good for you but in between there's a lot of gray zones and that's what we, where we have to give individual advice and help women steer them into the right direction rather than tell them what to do, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So as Mandy mentioned, she mentioned all those other hormones and certainly running a huge uh, support group and working with women individually. Um, one, Some of the things that often come up are things like you know, sort of what's going on around my adrenal, what's going on with my cortisol, why am I waking up with palpitations, why am I so anxious, why is my IBS flared, etc. So I've, M Mandy and I have been chatting and what she's going to do is she's going to try and give us a really good overview of what's going on with some of those other complex hormones in relation specifically to menopause. Um, so we're not necessarily going to be talking specifically estrogen, progesterone, testosterone today. We're going to be talking about all those other things that are going on. And I hope it will give you the idea of this is to give you sort of a more rounded picture of what's going on. And specifically for those people who perhaps they and not necessarily sort of 100% on their current treatment 
or you can't have HRT at all, um, or you're coming towards the time where you might be considering some kind of management for your menopause symptoms. I hope this is going to give you a sort of, as I say, a wider sort of maybe more holistic view of what's all going on. So you're gonna hear not a lot of me and hopefully a lot of Mandy. <laughs> Because um, bless her, she has prepared some lovely slides to talk us through, which is brilliant. So, Mandy, I'm going to shut up. I will interject with questions. Please do. Absolutely. But um, you're going to talk us through some slides, lovely, aren't you? Yeah. Brilliant. I just thought um, because um, it's easy to visualise things um, and see that see a picture. Yeah, definitely. Um, sometimes. Um, let me share that with you. Um, let me do that. Oops. Um, hang on. Um, there we go. Um, I'm not. I'm not yet screen sharing, am I? No. So oh, here we go. Think? It's coming. Let's go. One. That's the last one. We have to go to the. <laughs> um, perfect. Um, so okay. So this is just a little for for um, for those who are not medically trained, or you know, even for doctors, it is super super com complex. The endocrine system and. Um, it's it's um, we have different glands in the in the body that that make different hormones and we call that the endocrine system. And to, the most important um, point that I want to make is that everything starts in the brain with hormones. All of our hormones are the, the signal for what our organs do and make in the end comes from the brain. And it's the hypothalamus, which is so super, super important. The hypothalamus makes uh, the signaling hormone for the thyroid gland. It makes dopamine and the uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone goes on to uh, ask the pituitary gland to make you our FSH and LH, which helps with um, ovulation and fertility and ask our ovaries to make estrogen. So this is just an overview to show you that everything starts in the brain. And that's why we need to look after our brain. We need to look after our brain health, our mental health. We need to, we need to make sure that the brain has time to recover because it cannot run consistently at a high pace. Um, and that's where we'll, we'll be talking about stress later on. Yeah. So the brain, and we've got different glands, thyroid, we've got our adrenal glands, and they sit on top of our kidneys here. There are little caps on top. We've got our pancreas that makes insulin and glucose and, and other hormones. And then we've got our ovaries, of course, and in men, they have testicles. So, um, but the, the most important message is it, it starts in the brain. And if the brain signaling isn't working properly, your organs cannot work. They don't know because the brain's not telling them what to do. They're just waiting for the signal. And if the signal's not coming, they're not doing anything. And that's what you see in early menopause or in, in, pre um, in um, premature ovarian insufficiency. Sometimes it can start in the brain. So it's not always a problem with the actual organ. It's not always a problem with your ovaries if you're not functioning. And this is a very basic overview where the, these hormones that we're specifically interested in today come from. And we call them steroid hormones. And steroid hormones come from cholesterol. So they're specific. There's a specific ring that's cholesterol made of um, that, that molecule. And we call that, um, we call that a steroid. The, 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 Basically, this is the substrate for all steroid hormones. And the adrenal glands make some of them, and then our ovaries, of course. And cholesterol gets converted in our adrenal glands to pregnenolone, which is very important for word finding and, and memory and cognition. And then it goes on to be converted to other hormones, in particular cortisol and cortisone. Cortisol is the active hormone, the active stress hormone, and cortisone is the storage hormone. So when we are crossing the road and we're nearly getting run over by a bus, our body has some cortisol to work with, but it immediately uses the stored up cortisone to turn that into active cortisol that stops us on time, that makes our muscles work, our, uh, that, that increases our blood pressure, that, that puts the blood into our legs so we can step back from the road. So this is why cortisol and cortisone um, is, is, is a, a fight and flight hormone and acute, what we call acute phase hormone as well. Um, and then we've got DHEA, the dehydroepiandrosterone, which is a, a precursor hormone for uh, testosterone um, in particular. So half of our testosterone is made in our adrenal glands and the other half in a young woman is made in our ovaries. Mm. And um, testosterone is a super important hormone for women too. And we have actually 400 times more testosterone than estradiol. Now it's, it's something that declines with age and it is 
very important for libido, for energy, for emotional resilience, and um, for feeling, um, you know, having your mojo, basically, feeling, feeling energetic and well. In some women, it can backfire a bit. If it's too high, like in polycystic ovarian syndrome, they can get hair growth on the chin or around the nipple. They can get oily skin, acne spots. So as with all these hormones, there's a good side to it. And they do an yep. amazing job. But if they're not working, if they're too high, too low, they can cause problems. And we do actually, in menopause, replace testosterone. Not every woman needs it, but it can be the icing on the cake in those who aren't perfectly 100% optimal, optimally well on just estrogen and progesterone. And then we obviously, our ovaries make progesterone, but only when we ovulate. And they, it makes three types of, of estrogen. The most powerful one is E2, is estradiol. Now these arrows that you can see are enzymes and they are really, really important. Without these enzymes, we can't turn one thing to the next. Yeah. When we have... When we talk about endocrine disruptors, we're talking about molecules or we're talking about substances that can interfere, not just on the receptor, but they can also disturb these enzymes from turning one thing to the next. Mm -hmm. And one of them is alcohol. And that's why I always bang on about Interesting. Alcohol. It disturbs these enzymes, right? And if you want more testosterone, then the alcohol will stop that enzyme here. So, you know, in men, the first thing that men need to do to, to have more testosterone is stop drinking. Same with fertility. If you want to get pregnant, don't drink alcohol because it can affect your ovulation because mm. it stops your progesterone, it stops your estradiol, it stops your ovaries from, from producing the stuff we need to ovulate. So, um, and again, stress uh, interferes with these enzymes as well. So when we need cortisol, and stress interferes with this enzyme, then we may not have it at the time we actually need it. So this is just an overview. It's much more complex in real life than that, but but it's important to just have an idea about where our hormones come from. It's a really and good introduction though, Mandy, because I think, you know, a lot of people, we hear so much in menopause about estrogen, progesterone and testosterone, but you don't hear how you get to estrogen and you know for a lot of people you know unless they've studied specifically whether that is you know sort of around physical or mental health yeah. they they don't know those things and I think for me what I've found working specifically in the area of menopause um, is that for a lot of women there a lot of their questions seem to go unanswered because yeah. They don't have this background information. And I think that's a lot of the frustration with is mm -hmm. sort of, you know, I, I've got these, I've suddenly got these intolerances. I suddenly can't tolerate alcohol. I've suddenly developed hives. I've suddenly got IBS, um, all kinds of things. And it's sort of, well, that's because you're in perimenopause, but why? And I think that's the thing is for so many women, there are, and I'm sure it's the same in lots of other areas too, but I only focus on menopause. Mm. Um, I think it's just having this understanding of the pathways. I think it really helps to understand yeah. what's going on sort of at the other end. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. And one of the, the, the things, the typical things, for example, that I, I sometimes get asked is, well, my libido is low, but I don't want estrogen. I just want testosterone. So I'm like in my late 40s and I'm not keen. I've, you know, I've heard so much about breast cancer and estrogen, but I've heard testosterone is great. Can I have just testosterone? Well, no, you can't. No, you can't. <laughs> because you, you take that lovely testosterone and you blow it all on estrogen. <laughs> the basic anyway, way, yeah. You have to be well estrogenized before the testosterone can do its job. And can you, Mandy, it. can you just explain that a little more? Why, sure. why that is? So when we go to the perimenopause or the menopause, I mean, this is, sorry, I don't have this on my screen. But can you, <laughs> these are our estrogen levels through our lifetime. It starts with nothing at the puberty, going up, the brain going through massive changes in, uh, with development. Between 20 and 40, our golden years that we do not appreciate enough when we feel great, when we have energy, we have our career, we are healthy. This is the perimenopause. Do you see those yep. terrible fluctuations? Now, this is, the perimenopause is for some women not an easy ride. It's not a gentle decline where we can 
slowly get used to and it's, it's you know it's, it gives us it allows that time to adjust no it's crazy fluctuations yeah up and down and that means that we get migraines we get mood swings we get irritability that woman here will flood she'll have really heavy periods because she has lots of estrogen she'll um, build up lots of learning she'll shed it and then eventually we'll reach rock bottom which is menopause and that's what we spend the rest of life in 30 years, no estrogen. And it's not a process we go through and come out the other end as a new person. We either live with it and manage to adapt or we don't and need help. Yeah. So the thing is that a woman down here will lose her libido as well, probably, because she is having less estrogen. And one source for estrogen in the menopausal woman is testosterone. Because we have an enzyme, very clever aromatase enzyme, that can turn testosterone into estradiol. And that will become the main source of our estrogen. However, we are losing our lovely testosterone in the process. So while your body is really desperate to make up for the lost estrogen, in the, in the process, we are losing our testosterone. So not only do we not have enough estrogen and the little bit of testosterone that we convert will not make up for that, but we're also lo losing that other substrate that we need, which is the testosterone. Yeah. So what we need to do first in women when we are putting them on HRT, we need to prop up the estradiol, get them the estrogen levels to an acceptable level where they start feeling great. And often they don't need testosterone because that can already help with estrogen and if with um, libido. And if yes, not that, it doesn't quite work and they're still having brain fog, they're still crying and emotional, not quite stable, then we can add the testosterone. But if you give testosterone by itself, you only, all you do is, your body will do is take that testosterone and turn it into estrogen. So you're, it's not going to do the job you want it to do. No. That's why it isn't just as straightforward as saying, oh, my testosterone is low. I just replaced it and that's it. No, you just turn your testosterone into estrogen. That's what your body is really after, right? And that's why it is more complex than just taking one thing and putting um, putting it back. It You need to look at the other connected puzzle pieces that are equally important. That's why it's such a good example of those connections because, you know, sort of we you know sort of certainly I've heard that before where it's just my libido and it's well no it's it's not actually it, it's much more complex than that but again I think unless you understand that unless you understand these you know the complexity um so that's that's a brilliant example thank you yeah and this is how they are connected and that's why it's not as simple as saying I'll give you that and you'll feel better because um, they are all connected. And, and also when we increase estrogen, we sometimes lower thyroid function as well. So it, it's, it's connected and we have to look at other medication. That's why anyone who prescribes HLT or hormones needs to take a careful medical history to look at what else are they taking? What is the history? What else is going on? If someone has a history of cystic acne and polycystic ovarian syndrome, I very rarely give them testosterone because they have a genetic because trait where there's testosterone and de dehydrated testosterone and that actually yes. can backfire so you they've just had a break from the acne because finally they're menopausal so you give them testosterone and what do you and do you give it back yeah exactly yeah um so that the one hormone that we're talking wanted to touch on today was was cortisol mm. i already it's a, it's a fight and flight hormone it's it's very important we make it in our adrenal gland on demand very quickly so it's always in our bloodstream, but we make it on demand by converting cortisone into cortisol. Um, but so cortisol has a bad press, but it is, it is very important. It's a very important hormone and it doesn't deserve this bad press. The problem is that we, make, we tend to make it and those who have problems with it, we, they make it at the wrong time of the day because cortisol follows a very strict circadian rhythm. And what do I mean with that? It means that at certain times of the day, you make more than on other times of the day so we we actually make cortisol and the first the the, 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 the highest level of cortisol in the day is um within the first 30 minutes after waking up and that's called um the cortisol awakening response and what that means is you uh, you wake up you get out of bed you go to the window open the curtains you look into the sunlight and the sunlight goes through your retina into your brain and then triggers cortisol release and that wakes you up, that gives you energy, that makes you feel good, ready for the day, lots of energy. And that is what we want. We want that cortisol awakening response. We want to have that energy. We don't want to be sluggish and we don't want just to need five cups of coffee before we actually get out of the door. 
Um, and a lot of women, particularly in the perimenopause, report that. They say, I wake up in the morning and I feel like I had no sleep. Yeah. I just feel shattered and they're tired all the day. And what do they do? They have their five cups of coffee, even late in the afternoon. And that's when things get worse because coffee has the half life of six to seven hours and keeps on really disturbing nighttime sleep. So you, we, not, we really want that what, um, cortisol awakening response. And what then happens is cortisol peaks 30 minutes after we got, get out, out of bed or wake up. And then it, it slowly declines in the day. And you see, this is when, it's, when it should be really low. This is when we do our work. We should come home ideally at three o'clock and then have a cup of tea, put up <laughs> and relax. Yeah, that's what we're designed for. We get up with the, with the, with the sunlight in the morning in our Stone Age time. We yeah. see the sunlight, we get up, we, we collect our berries. And then when we've done our day's work, we relax and we sit by the fire and tell stories. But and it's such a and it and the thing is life in the 21st century is no. so wildly different from what we were designed for isn't it yes or what our brain adapt was was adapted for you know yeah. through, through evolution yeah. and the problem is particularly the worst women or the worst people affected by menopause um is, is our night shift workers you you have, diane you must have talked and seen shift workers right yeah the, Nurses that do seven nights in a row and then a week off and so on. Shift working, night shifts are the worst, uh, it's, it's so detrimental. And there comes a point when they can't function and when they give up their job. Yeah, they have a terrible time. Yes, because it they disrupt on top of their ovarian problems, they also have disrupted circadian rhythm yeah. with, the, with the cortisol. And you see, this is when we should be relaxing and we should dim the light, we should have our meal and then get ready for bed and not looking at our screen, not <laughs> having, you know, um, the stimulation, ongoing stimulation. For the brain, um, yeah. Yeah, and then it, we go to bed and then it, it builds up overnight, ready for the day. And melatonin, another really important hormone, is, it, is, in, in, is inversely correlated to that. So melatonin is low here and then goes up in the evening. Yeah. It is inversely correlated two cortisol. So they are partner, partnering together. They're very happily going together. But melatonin is only made when lights are dim, is dimmed, when we're good and ready for bed. And this, these bright lights we have now will suppress melatonin production and will keep our cortisol levels going throughout the day. Um, and when we talk about um, particularly women in the perimenopause, so the, the, the years um, when we're starting to see ovarian function kind of declining, we're still making estrogen, but they're starting to fluctuate. We are not ovulating every month, only ever so often. So we are particularly vulnerable to have experiencing other hormones also playing up, in particular thyroid. So thyroid problems are really common in your late 40s. Hashimoto's is an inflammatory disease. We are very susceptible to to um, other autoimmune pro problems like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus. Um, we see lots, lots of these problems happen. Also, you mentioned that histamine intolerance, which is another subject. We're going to do a separate thing all about yeah, that, aren't we? <laughs> it's very complex. But the, the cortisol is, this study is really exciting. It's been done by this team in America um, and it's only been published a few months ago. And they looked at the connection between cortisol awakening response and perimenopause, what's happening in that time to our cortisol? Yep. Well, they found that women who have really bad hot flushes, so night sweats and hot flushes in the day, the worse they are, the worse the hot flushes are, the more blunted their cortisol awakening response. Okay. So that's really interesting. So it, it means that these women, when they get up in the morning, they do not make that as much cortisol as the woman who doesn't have hot flushes and night sweats. And we do know that severe vasomotor symptoms are associated independently with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Yeah. What we don't know is whether it's the hot flushes triggering the or suppress the the, cort the cortisol or whether it's the lack of cortisol. Whether it's the other way. Yes. But we, there is definitely a connection. So but for these women, knowing that, knowing that in the perimenopause, you're starting to have a blunted cortisol awakening response means we have to look after our circadian rhythm even more. We have to look after our sleep hygiene. 
So that cortisol awakening response, the preparation for that is not that morning, it's the night before. It's when we go to sleep, when we are wanting to have a really good quality sleep and then it builds up to have this, this, this response in the morning. And also getting up at the same time of the day, not sleeping in. Yeah. I know women who are actually awake at seven on a weekend, but they lie until 10. And you know what? They don't feel better. They feel like death. It yep. doesn't, when you awake, regardless of what time it is, well, a reasonable time, you know, <laughs> not five o'clock doing the ironing, but um, reasonable time, yeah. after seven, on maybe eight on the weekend, get up, go to the window, let that sunlight into your eye to trigger yep. that. You may need that little bit of extra help for that cortisol awakening response. So do not be in bed with the curtains drawn and look at your phone. You want that sunlight, get up, shake your muscles, shake, shake your, your, your bones, get that sunlight into your eye, get those muscles working. And, and that's how you can support your cortisol awakening response. Stop the coffee after 12 noon. Yeah. So you get a good night's sleep. Really yeah. important. Switch off. Properly let that brain relax in the evening. That will really help with the, with the cortisol as well. And you can see that was really significant that these women with severe hot flashes have um, a very much blunted cortisol response and they will be tired in the morning they will drag themselves through the day they will probably need a nap in the afternoon because they are not having their lovely circadian rhythm that they are meant to have so what happens then is that um that might even having that stress might then affect your ovaries so your estrogen dial is fluctuating even more even because, more yeah because what do you do when you sleep deprived when you're tired you snack you eat sugary stuff you, you go for the biscuits and who can who can blame them right yeah, absolutely um also it takes away our motivation to do exercise and exercise is really important for mental yeah. health right yeah. absolutely and, and so when we are waking up tired in the morning we are less likely to do exercise and movement and we are less likely to have the motivation to go so it's slightly a vicious cycle we need to look after that circadian rhythm and go to bed at the same time, good bedtime routine, no alcohol, no caffeine at the wrong time of the day, mm -hmm. no sense, um, shutting, you know, really relaxing the brain. Because on top of the cortisol problem in the perimenopause, we obviously have the ovaries not working their optimal best, you know, only make a bit of estrogen here, there and everywhere, not reliably when they should do. But they're really trying, they're still trying hard to get that egg out, to get that last egg out, you know. So, but these fluctuations increase our sensitivity to stress. Yeah. So we are less resilient to stress, work stress, um, flying around the world, um, circadian rhythm disruption, night shifts, relationship stress, financial stress, worrying. Now, not only do we have- living in, a, living in a worldwide pandemic stress. Crazy, crazy, yeah. How do you relax, um, you know, how do, physical, financial, emotional, previous trauma, all this adds up. And so we have less resilience to stress and it makes us more vulnerable. Yeah. And then when we do have stress and, and it goes comes on top of us, we also have a, more, a higher risk of depression and yeah. mental health issues. Anxiety is a common one um, that, you know, to um, actually reaching proper depressive symptoms as well. And um, this is where we have this debate about should we put women on antidepressants in the perimenopause? And I have no, I, I do feel that if they are um, suitable people, suitable candidates for HRT, they can try that first. Because if you support your ovaries and if you, if you kind of smooth the fluctuations, you can actually help with their energy. You can help with, with their stress resilience and they may not need to go on on antidepressants. Mm. However, I am not dogmatic. If a woman is suicidal and she's on HRT and she's not functioning, I have no problem with her going on antidepressants. And no woman out there should feel guilty by taking them because they have her function. Every woman is different. So um, it's about, and it's also, Mandy, isn't it? It's about picking the right thing for the right exactly. woman. It's about Correct. choosing the right medication for the right woman yeah. for the right amount of time, keeping her monitored, exactly. not leaving her on these things for, you know, exactly. as I have to say, I've seen with some women 15 plus years. Um, yeah. you know, and it's also, this is so much more complex, isn't it? Than just about 
replacing hormones. This is yes. also about, as you say, this is about us looking after ourselves too. Yeah, setting boundaries. And first of all, the, first, the most important thing to start with is to identify that you are stressed, to identify that something else is going on. I see women who go for a 10 mile run three or four times a week. They have a busy job. They push themselves to the limit. And when I see them, I say, how do you feel after you run? And they say, I feel absolutely exhausted. I take, it takes me a couple of days to recover from my muscle aches and pains, but I love running. So I push myself to do this. And what I say to them, look, that running is all, all great. However, it's a form of stress. Yeah you're putting stress on your body and why don't you just run a bit less twice a week and midweek you allow your body to recover and you do a bit of yoga some strengthening some mindfulness some some um, weights and just vary the exercise you do because some things that we perceive as beneficial such as exercise can be a form of stress and we are often underestimate that pushing yourself for run after being sleep deprived is a form of stress yeah so we need to we need to look at these women and look at uh, how are they living their lives are they are they actually uh, doing something that is detrimental and should they maybe temporarily before they feel better um reduce the running and do something else maybe some weights you know and do some 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 breathing exercises so this is also important and it's our perception of what is stress that needs to change as well because stress is not the same for for the same person you know um we, we know what we, we can all identify with certain types of stress, but other, other factors are not identified as stress at all. Um, I think there's also been, I think there's also um, certainly, I would say since the eighties, there has been this culture of stress being sort of um, a badge of honor of achievement and you having to push yourself to the limit rather than working within the boundaries that you set for yourself that work for you to have a healthy life. And mm -hmm. I think that has become quite a cultural pressure, particularly in sort of the in the business world. I think that's become a really a big, um, a big pressure for people. And, you know, kind of having to, you have to be the one to be in the office first, you have to be in the one to be in the office last, etc, etc. Mm -hmm. et cetera. And so to, for people to be able to sort of look after themselves, they're sometimes challenged with how can I do that, but still be seen to be the most proactive person within my department or within my office. And sometimes that takes a complete change of life. You know, for some people, they will step away completely. But very often, particularly in what I do, I very often see those people, and it's not just women, it's men too, who yeah. are, they're at the point of burnout. They're at the point of, um, you know, essentially turning up at A&E because they yeah. think they're having a heart attack. Um, and then you have to start to sort of help them to work through, okay, so, it, you know, there are, what's really important. We, let's look at what's really important. Let's look at what you can change, what is manageable for you to be able to live essentially a healthier life. Yeah, that's true. Setting, yeah, setting boundaries, um, stopping stimulants and stimulation like your phone and also um, being aware that not being available 24 hours is not a badge of honor, as you said, you know. And I have friends who text me and then I often have my phone in another room and I do stuff and and then they text me again and they say, many I've texted you five minutes ago, why don't you reply? Well, because I'm not tied to my phone and what you've texted me about is really not life-threatening. I can text, I can return that text tomorrow and you're still all right. You know, it's nothing urgent. It's just like- Yeah, I mean, phones, phones are, um, phones have definitely sort of ramped things up. And I always say to people, you know, just remember, Every time your phone rings, pings or tings, that's somebody else trying to decide how you spend your time. Exactly. And um, you, you have to decide how you spend your time because 99.9 time, times out of 100, that's not going to be urgent. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
and and it is a skill that we previously did not require to have filtering through what's essential and what's not yeah now because of the influx of these companies trying to sell you stuff or people influence you know people who are omnipresent they make their message appear the most important yeah and it's almost impossible for our brain to distinguish between the message that is important and the message that just appears to want to be important absolutely and the only way to do this is to not look at the phone because it's impossible for the brain these it's not like advertising you know and the influx the turnover of the stimulus that that when you look on twitter it, it's it's so addictive because you get a reward a reward a reward you read and the messages are designed to to cater for your very short attention span and oh, the, the design of twitter the design of Twitter is, is, well, it's phenomenally clever yes. for the people. But, but I have to say, I mean, I don't know about you, but it, Twitter is not a place that I spend very much time at all um, because I, I find it, um, I can find it quite a toxic place. So <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't personally, I've chosen not to, I have a Twitter account, but I don't spend very much time there at all. I agree. And um, yes, because that is time of your lifetime that you never get back. <laughs> time spent of, on, and it doesn't have an influence. It can trigger anxiety. If you read a lot of negative um, messages in a Absolutely. row, COVID, when people didn't know about what's happening, they all um, vented their anxiety on Twitter. And you read a hundred messages, people being worried about the job, about their health, someone dying. Oh, look, 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 look. And then what do you do with it? How do you respond? This is like um, being in a cage with a tiger. You know, you can't escape. No. But the only way to to get away from that is leave the cage. Switch off. Switch off. And, and leave yeah. the tiger locked up. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's but that's the thing, isn't it? Is because because of, you know, sort of because of the way that the brain works, because of the emotional brain, because of the way the amygdala works, et cetera, et cetera, you know very often we get into a place where we do feel as if it is you know kind of that scary tiger and yeah. it's almost as if we can't get away but you have to be able to step back and see things with the rational brain to recognize that actually you can step away you do have a choice to make absolutely a choice is a, it's an important message here we all have that choice yeah and that Spending time in nature is so important away from oh, the phone. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's free, it's super healthy, it gives you the sunlight, the vitamin D, the fresh air. It is COVID safe. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't, yeah, so this is, uh, I, I'm a big fan of tree hugging, you know, well, not, not literally, but yeah, you can. I don't it. know, not, not always a bad thing on a dry day. <laughs> absolutely, on a dry day, exactly. And um, in German, we have this saying, there's no bad weather, there's only bad clothing. <laughs> I think they have a similar one in Scotland. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so that's important. And again, that helps you with your circadian rhythm. So if you go for a walk in daylight, we're now all stuck in these rooms, uh, working from home, staring at the screen. Natural daylight is completely different. It's actually beneficial and healthy Absolutely. for your body and for your mood. And also your eyesight, you look into the distance, you accommodate, you know, into the distance. So many people need glasses now because they're looking at the screen. So yeah, but we can make that decision and the world does not come to an end if you leave your desk uh, for half an hour at lunch and go out around the block for- Or put your phone down. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you have to make that decision. You have to actively be involved in that decision-making. And yeah. that's that's the important thing. Otherwise, yes, you can. it can lead to, to, to um, uh, breakdowns and yeah. uh, anxiety. And, and, and it isn't something that happens, and this is really important. It's not something that happens overnight unless you experience acute trauma, someone dying, you're running, get run over or whatever it's something that creeps up on you and then absolutely you when you were feeling well and you think this is the status quo this is the the new known familiar familiarity and sometimes some women have a a um a, 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 a threshold where they do not like to step over what's known to them so they want to remain in the status quo they they don't want to make any changes because this is familiar and stepping outside their comfort zone even if it's as simple as going for a walk isn't something that comes easy to them but it is really important and sometimes it needs that little extra help seeing a counselor or seeing someone to be told do that 
I'm going to prescribe you outside time. And that's it's what you have so to it's so interesting because so often, particularly in therapy, you see you see that with that level of, well, this is safe. It's yeah. really uncomfortable. It's really uncomfortable. Sometimes, you know, sometimes sometimes almost life-threateningly uncomfortable, depending on what the situation is. But I know it. I know this situation. And then it's about, I think very often it's, it's about letting people realise, getting them back to a place where they realise that ultimately they do have choice. But it's also then about encouraging them to recognise the resources that maybe they've forgotten that they had before this new normal which I'm not keen mm -hmm. on the term but until it yeah. came along um yeah. it's so fascinating it, you know it's such an interesting thing and it's you know it's always such a um I'm sure you feel the same about what you do but it's always such an honor to be part of seeing that progression and seeing that and of course there will always be some people who they don't feel that they can move past that but exactly. when you can when you can when you can help somebody to recognize that they do have choice and that they do have the strength and resilience and resources exactly. you know sort of within themselves to be able to do that you know as i say it's um you know it's a huge honor to be part of that exactly and it's also small changes it doesn't have to you don't have to turn your life around overnight you can make small changes you can have rules for example you can say on the weekend i will not look at my work phone i put that work phone in a drawer and i will not get it out that will make a huge difference to your family life to your relationships probably because your children do not see you reading on your phone you know or lying on the sofa big sources um and sort of small changes just um changing that circadian routine getting up in the morning having having your breakfast and then having one positive thing that you do in the day a half an hour walk or, these are all smart changes they are they're all realistic changes that yeah. are easy to do and every little change builds up to a big beneficial thing like changing your diet a little bit looking at how many vegetables you eat in the day making that effort doing that prepping your food so that you have a healthy snack to snack on instead of reaching for the biscuits and just um, decide what what where do you want to work on in your life not work on all the things i always one find small that, thing yeah that suitcase allegory i find that quite nice um where you have um, lots of issues cramped in a suitcase and you can't, that suitcase hardly closes. And when you open it, everything explodes and comes out. What you do is you open that suitcase, you take one tiny little thing out, close it, and then you look at that thing and then you work on that. And then you, bit by bit, you unpick that suitcase and you leave it closed until you're ready to open it fully. And, um, but later on, when you are ready, you will see that it's, it's empty because you've worked on the issues, right? And there's no such overwhelming thing left in the suitcase that is so sc scary and threatening. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely that lovely. Right, okay, so, yes, sorry, <laughs> I've, I've stopped you. You crack on. <laughs> yes, I crack on. I just want to mention that, that briefly, stress, any form of stress, emotional, physical, pain, inflammation, uh, night shifts, um, over-exercise can have an impact, starting in the brain, but going on to reduce our peripheral sex hormones, including cortisol, um, inc including yeah, um, um, pre um, um, estrogen, um, progesterone, and testosterone, also our thyroid function. And in terms of, um, it can even have an impact on our gut health because stress can alter. There's evidence that it changes the bacteria living in our gut, in in our in our bowels, and they actually make 80% of our serotonin, which is our happy hormone. It's not the brain that makes serotonin, it's actually the gut. And if you've got beneficial gut bacteria that makes serotonin, then you'll be a happier person. Your IBS may be less severe. You may have fewer palpitations, less anxiety. And this is also triggered by the vagus nerve, which, which relaxes us. It's the parasympathetic uh, system, which is, has a relaxing effect. Breathing helps with that. Um, Definitely. Targeting inflammation and also um, the, the gut microbiomes, they, can, they have an influence over the tryptophan meta metabolism, which again, tryptophan is converted into serotonin and melatonin, so our sleep hormone. So there's a huge emerging research about the importance of gut health. And there are some patented strains now we can tar use target and target um, these, these specific strains that make serotonin. 
But essentially, before you take a supplement, why not look at what you eat and feed those bacteria? So you want to eat lots of plants um, that make short chain fatty acids, which feed those little bacteria. So broccoli, all the green stuff, it's all your friend. To, so make an effort to, to eat something that really is beneficial. Um, but when we look at long-term stress and chronic stress, um, this is maybe where it all leads to if we are not addressing those issues. Initially, in that green phase here, we have still got that circadian rhythm. Our body can cope with stress. We can cope with whatever happens. And we are okay. We function. We sleep well. We have energy in the day. Now, when that stress is relentless and does not stop and more stress adds, is added, we have to adapt, we have to build some resistance, which means we're making cortisol throughout the day at the wrong time of the day, which means sometimes that we, we, make a, we wake up with anxiety in the morning because actually we're making too much cortisol in the morning, more than we need or at the wrong time of the day. So our body is trying to counteract that stress or is responding to the constant stimulus that we're experiencing. And that's what we would call chronic stress. And so when the stress is relentless and ongoing, without any recovery phases or relaxation time. Yeah, even the adaptation processes eventually break down. And we used to call that, you know, commonly known as burnout, nervous breakdown, yeah. physical aggression. Um, you know, this is, there are lots of other phrases that are not really recognized by the medical professional, but we all know what exhaustion is. All, and this is basically the result of failed adaptation. This is too late. When you're down here, it's really hard to come back, but you can. The, the real key where you need to look at is here. Don't don't allow yourself to to get to the red box. Yeah, yeah. you want to avoid getting to the red box. And this is really what stress does. Stress leads to obesity. It leads to insulin resistance, anxiety, mood, irregular periods, periods infertility. Um, it, it really affect, um, affects our immune system, makes our blood pressure go up. And the the, the simple and free things we can do to counteract stress is doing some mindfulness practice, yoga, tree hacking, meaningful relationships. So not the toxic friend who's constantly niggling and wants to say no. The word no is the most important word in our vocabulary. No is- The joy you... of no. <laughs> yes. Um, three, three days, yeah, it's all you need sometimes and not feel guilty. You do not have to justify. Don't explain, don't complain. Yeah, just, just say no. Yep. Yeah, sleep hygiene. It's very empowering. It is. And sometimes, particularly women, when they lose their confidence in perimenopause, yeah. forget that they have the right to say no. Yeah, yeah. to yeah. Yeah, no to work, no to... Absolutely. Um, so then uh, just a quick word on some other external things that can disrupt your hormones. One of them are, they're called endocrine disruptors. They're chemicals that interfere with your hormone endocrine system. And I'm not going into great details with them, but there can be chemicals and they're particularly in plastic, BPA, plastic bottles, children, yep. you know, the water, some types of medication, chemicals that are in flame retardants, cosmetics, solvents. They're literally everywhere. It's hard to avoid them, but you can by using glass bottles, avoiding plastic if you can, um, not having ready meals, meals in the microwave in a plastic container. You know, but sometimes if you only do that now and then, fine, don't feel guilty, but try and be mindful of some of the chemicals that you might be exposed to that yeah. you're not aware. And the one thing I want to talk about is a little bit is alcohol, because alcohol is a, again, is the chemical. You have a choice over whether you use it or not. And alcohol is bad. There's no two ways about it. Alcohol increases, as we all know, breast cancer more than HRT. Yeah. yeah how bad alcohol is and that's just your two glasses of wine every night that's not even being an alcoholic yeah no. we're not talking alcoholism we're talking recreational alcohol that's your middle class woman who has a gin and tonic every night yeah because that's what she does and or she has really nice expensive red wine and surely that's better than the cheap stuff and surely that is okay no it's not no <laughs> whether it's a it's your 50 pound bottle of champagne or whether it's your your 30p bottle and can of cider it is the same right and um i know this sounds really hard but one of the first things i tell women in the perimenopause when i look at alcohol in consumption is stop if you can or reduce as much as you can yeah absolutely um, use it to medicalize themselves with alcohol yes absolutely and often women who have not necessarily 
um, drunk alcohol regularly will, as you say, be using it literally to sort of help them get through yeah. when at not realizing that actually it's making things worse. Exactly, yeah. And it really affects your ovarian function. It can actually cause infertility. It can be a major cause of infertility in men and women. Um, it really lowers your testosterone. In, um, it, it can actually increase your estrogen. And that's an odd one where you think, oh, well, we're all about estrogen. We want more estrogen. So why drinking alcohol increases my estrogen? Is why is that bad? Well, it does increase estrogen because your liver cannot process estrogen anymore as effectively because they're competing. And alcohol affects the metabolism pathway of the estrogen through the liver where your liver is deactivating estrogen and wants to get rid of it. So it gets secreted in the bile and out it goes through the gut system or the kidneys. Alcohol stops or it hinders that process. So you may end up with higher levels of estrogen in your bloodstream, but it's the wrong type of estrogen. It's those metabolites you want to get rid of. And that gives you breast tenderness. That leads to man boobs and, ma and males who drink a lot of alcohol. Yeah. Leads to, um, to severe, more severe fluctuations. And we all know that women who drink alcohol when they have a drink the night before, that night they might have more night sweats, they might have more hot flushes. Yeah. So really want to avoid that because alcohol is a very avoidable um, endocrine disruptor that, that stops ovulation, that can cause miscarriage, osteoporosis, anxiety, depression, disrupts sleep, disrupts testosterone. And it has a nutrient free, uh, so it, it has, it is, empty calories zero just, zero nutritional yeah, value zero nutritional value um and this is something where we need to kind of get the message on board that if you are worried about breast cancer on hrt look at the alcohol first and then you know maybe it's not as bad as you think um it's also involved in other cancers like liver cancer and so on um, i think it's also important mandy isn't it to say you know sort of the um the around hrt of course you know kind of with now with body identical plant derived estrogen and progesterone we then have to look at the fact that you have a choice too over the type of hrt that you might decide to use it's not exactly. all it's not all old it's not all tablets there are there are options too aren't there now exactly there's the transdermal estrogen is much much um favorable over oral estrogen, although I have to say there are some women who may not absorb it. So yeah, that's true. Yep. But particularly if you do take oral estrogen, then you do have that first pass metabolism through the liver. And that's when alcohol comes in. And when you actually want, if you, let's say you are unfortunate enough to not tran absorb a transdermal, fine, that's what it is. And you, mm -hmm. you still can oral if you have no contraindications, but then maybe look at the alcohol consumption because you don't want to put more strain on your liver um, because a normal healthy liver can work perfectly well with yeah. that estrogen that you take. Yeah, it's fine. It will ne probably never in a bad way affect your liver ever. But if you uh, add other burdens to it, then it probably can affect it's that, having you know? to work harder, isn't it? Yes, exactly. And again, it affects the enzymes. And estrogen is really our, our main source of fuel, our substrate, substrate that we need to feel well. But when, so it's like an engine, and when we, we fill, fill up with fuel, that's our estrogen. But when the engine has a broken, uh, you know, some, something else broken, and we don't fix that, then all that estrogen in the engine is not going to work. No. It's not going to be able to do the job if we throw alcohol in and if we, if we um, overheat the engine with that. Yeah, that's yeah absolutely. No, absolutely Brilliant. lovely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that's alcohol. And um, yeah, don't forget osteoporosis again menopause osteoporosis a um, very strong connection and, and we don't want to enhance that problem absolutely um, not and just a quick i uh, mentioned about sleep so sleep is a really really important um um health related issue and we do need um a certain amount of sleep and the sleep is the time going back to the first slide where i said everything starts in the brain yeah. the sleep is the time when you give your brain a break when the brain recovers we need to give the brain the chance to make new networks, to, uh, to process the experiences we had in the day, to put away the old rubbish we don't longer need. We know that sleep deprivation, ongoing sleep deprivation is associated with Alzheimer's risk, with the increased risk of Alzheimer's, because yeah. it looks like that when you are sleep deprived, your brain cannot 
get rid of the, uh, the um, molecules that are no longer needed and they build up in the form of plaques or a towel, you know, these. So there, there are- You can't discard the rubbish, can it? Exactly, yeah, exactly. And it increases inflammation as well. Um, it increases insulin resistance. Someone who wants to lose weight and isn't sleeping will not lose weight, regardless of what kind of hardcore diet you go on. There's been studies that looked at sleep deprivation. There have been controlled studies where they had two groups. One group was sleep deprived five hours a night. The other group was allowed to sleep as much as they wanted. They were both put in front of buffets with a range of very unhealthy processed sugary food up to um, very healthy food. Now the sleep deprived group was going straight for the unhealthy food because they were craving sugar. It really affects your willpower. It and sugar is, this, is the main, the glucose is the main source of fuel for the brain. So if you haven't slept and your brain is so exhausted, you will go for the biscuit. Whereas the non-sleep deprived group went for the healthy snacks. They were making conscious decisions because they weren't so exhausted. Yeah. So that's the difference. And also it really slows down your metabolism. So when you, someone wants to lose weight, sleep has the most important influence over weight loss if you want to lose weight. There's no point going on a diet if you don't sleep, really. I mean, I'm sticking my neck out here and there will be some- <laughs> We love lessons. that. We love you sticking your oh. neck out. <laughs> Yeah, let's say I see these women, they go on a calorie deficient diet and probably in that case, I believe that they're not eating much, but most often they, they don't say the truth. But uh, if you don't, if you sort out sleep, you will lose weight, you will become healthy, you will do more exercise and it will become more efficient. Um, injury of sport is, is increased. Um, the, uh, and it can lead to mental illness and lack of energy. Again, it can impair immune system, cognitive function, brain fog. Um, and and that's why I think, again, going back to the circadian rhythm, try and look at sleep, look at where, where you, what you're doing in the day, look at activity phases versus relaxation phases and find that balance so that you contribute to your sleep. Probably some people are better off exercising in the morning yep. rather than evening. So look at how do you feel when you exercise at seven in, in the evening? Does it make you feel stressed and wound up? You come back and you're like a Duracell bunny probably not a good thing then maybe exercise in the day and not in the evening look at your lifestyle look at what you eat and drink before you go to bed yeah maybe you have carbohydrates before bedtime um and have um you know more protein during the day and things like that um it's it's there are lots of supplements that can help with um with sleep i do use melatonin in older in women over 50 which is a really helpful hormone um estrogen again helps with sleep um, if, they, if you can have it, um, uh, progesterone helps with sleep. Again, if you're not intolerant, so it's, but as, as, you, as you know yourself, it's not as easy as just giving a woman a micronized progesterone and then, and then hoping for the best. Most of them are okay, but some aren't, sadly, yeah. right? Yeah, so exactly. We can, look at, we can look at other things like L-theanine, which is, an, is a green tea extract, which can help with sleep, valerian, rhodiola is good for anxiety as well. These are sort of adaptogen herbs. Yep. Um, but I think the most important thing is to make room for yourself before bedtime or in the day that it's just time that you spend for yourself. Yeah. Where you truly relax, where you focus on your breathing, where you don't look at a light or screen, where you just relax. And that can be different for every person, but yeah. that's the most important thing. And when you do that every day, you will see over time how much better you'll feel and how your sleep improves and how your periods come back and improve or, you know, and that's, I think that's the, the, the message. It is complex um, and you can measure cortisol, for example. I don't always do that because the advice is really the same usually. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is, it's, it's a, it is about getting some time away from those external stimuli, isn't it? That's the, and it's, it's not always easy in you know in, in the 20 but it is something that we have to you know we have to again it's about about making choices for ourselves isn't it that's the that's the key mandy you have been absolutely marvelous i know that there are going to be so many questions <laughs> that yes, come I'm sorry. no 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 so don't apologize it's brilliant um, I know there's going to be so many questions that come out of what you have said. So may I um, invite you back for another session at some time where we can maybe address some of the questions that have come up out of today. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. It would be a pleasure. Thank you, Diane. And Bless I know 
touched on a few things, but sometimes just um, giving people an idea about where they could work on, just giving them a little bit of a kick and maybe just look at one thing at the time, you know, that can make a huge difference going forward. And um, about changing, turning your life upside down, it's about looking at small changes and not losing the motivation to do that. Just do it and see what happens. You have nothing to lose. Absolutely. Brilliant. A perfect note to end on. Thank you, my lovely. That was absolutely marvellous. Um, Mandy, if anybody would like to find out a little bit more about you, could you give me, is there a website that people can have a look at? Yes, I've got, I've got a website called um, hormoneequilibrium.co.uk, long name. Um, yes, yeah, so that, there's some more information about me and um, I'm on Twitter and I'm on Instagram. I'm not terribly active. I only do that ever so often, but yeah, follow me on Instagram, hormoneequilibrium. <laughs> <laughs> lovely. All right, my lovely. Thank you so much for your time. And I shall look forward to doing it again. Thank you. Thanks Bye. so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.